So we get the library. Yeah. 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 Y
And when we look at the, uh, the benefit, and as you three, throughout our, our national security strategy, just the importance of allies and partners, and one of the greatest things that we realize from that is, is developing long-term relationships. And as you mentioned, uh, recently highlighted by California and Ukraine that have been partners for over 28 years, just the years of interacting and knowing each other has built really a, uh, a camaraderie and the ability to reach out to each other at any time. But when you look specifically, as you mentioned, about the, the benefits to the National Guard and, and to the partner nations, so the one thing it does for the National Guard is it allows our soldiers and airmen to really visit a lot of other countries to look at the environment that they operate in and to really see, in many cases, the same problems just approached from a different angle. And so we learn a lot in those countries and those interactions that we bring back to make our organizations better. And I like to think vice versa, that if a certain country says, hey, we would really like to do a subject matter exchange on medical evacuation or you know, developing an NCO core, that that's something that we do really well at. And so we'd love to have that opportunity to train with them, show them what we have learned. Because ultimately, what both of us are trying to do is ensure the stability of our citizens and our countries. And anything we can do to them, when you look at the humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, which is you know one of the two main missions that we do, we can not only do the military training, which is our primary mission, but we can also say, hey, here's how we've applied this to, to floods, forest fires, natural disasters. And by doing that, we learn both from each other, and it, it really becomes mutually beneficial. Excellent. Yeah, that, that is uh, super interesting. So as you travel around, visit with uh, guard units, I'm sure this must come up. What, I mean, what, what kind of vibration do you get off the, the soldiers and the airmen about this program? Well, the first thing you see is this the smiles on their faces. Yeah. And they love to tell you about, oh my gosh, I was in Poland, or I was in Senegal, or I was in Cabo Verde. And they just talk about their experience, um, getting to know service members doing the same thing, serving their country, um, but in a different environment. And it's one of our, our best retention tools, is they get to go there and have that experience and train with them, uh, something that they may not have gotten to do otherwise. And then they develop these relationships where they continue to, to communicate with each other. And in many cases, they go on to be really good friends where they'll actually go visit them as a civilian in their civilian status, and vice versa. They'll come to the United States and visit. So uh, the big elephant in the room, Ukraine. Let's, let's zoom in on the uh, Star State Partnership Program and how it has helped Ukraine, how this developed, and, and where they are today now in that relationship. Yeah, so if you go back to the beginning um, with California and Ukraine back in uh, 1993, you know, the intent was there is to help them um, from a former Soviet bloc country um, to help look at how their military would work under a democracy. And, you know, California has done over the course of 29 years over a thousand engagements. And interestingly, um, unfortunately, when events started to occur, some folks were surprised by how Ukraine performed. And everyone with the National Guard says it's not a surprise to us at all, uh, because they've been training them uh, and training with them for almost 29 years. And then if you look at really the National Guard's role after the, uh, the invasion in 2014, uh, we established really the Joint Multinational Training Group, Ukraine. It was initially filled by an active duty brigade but then since 2016, there have been National Guard brigades going their training. In fact, it was Florida National Guardsmen that left just prior to the invasion that had been training the Ukrainian army. And actually today, they're doing that training, that training in Germany. Uh, re, they reconnecting. And when you look at the fact that over, really since 2016, we've had eight different Guard states rotate in to do that training, and many of those folks still communicate with folks that they were uh, training with in the Ukrainian army. And in many cases, you're seeing the manifestation of a lot of the great training that they did. Um, and for those familiar with our national training centers, both at uh, Fort Irwin, California, and then Fol Polk, Louisiana, we look at trying to replicate really complex environments to train in that. And that was the intent of JMTG, Joint Multinational Training Group, Ukraine, just outside of Lviv. And so we worked very closely with them on small unit tactics, 
um, NCO or non-commissioned officer leadership. Um, we worked on joint operations, uh, logistics. And what you're seeing now is some of the areas that, that they're being very successful in, you know, obviously completely attributable to their fact that they're standing up and they're fighting for their nation and their sovereignty. But within that, um, I think we're also seeing some of that training has been very beneficial to them as well. You know, I, I read where Florida is there, and I was like, what are they doing there? I thought this was California's uh, country, you know, and so now you've, you've cleared that up for me. I read it, uh, somewhere that uh, President Zelensky visited California last year in, in happier times. I also have read that um, California set up some sort of emergency operations center to, to help Ukraine. Can you talk about those? Yeah, so a lot of the things that, that we learn, we share with them when we talk about joint operations and how they look at really accountability or command and control. And because that was one of the areas we worked on them with, it has been a very good relationship. And actually, you know, when events occurred, some of the first phone calls went to the California Guard to say, hey, we're under attack, followed shortly by, here's what we need. And so I think because they had those established relationships that they just felt, hey, here's a friend I can reach out to, somebody I'm used to working with. And if you look at the Adjutant General for the state of California, Major General Dave Baldwin, you know, he's known a lot of the senior leaders within the Ukrainian Armed Forces for eight to ten years. And so they feel very comfortable reaching out to him. I, I was just struck by this picture of General Baldwin and President Zelensky on an airstrip somewhere, just talking like they were old buddies. Exactly. Yeah. So um, does that continue to this day, this emergency operation kind of give and take kind of thing? Yes. Yeah, so we've actually sent some California Guardsmen over to the UCOM AOR to, to help facilitate uh, that communications. And obviously there's other communications taking place. It's just one more venue um, for them to relay information and for us to, to take a look at, at how we can continue to assist them. Um, do you think, I, here's a kind of a calls for speculation on the part of the witness. Do you think the National Guard is a better uh, instrument for conducting this type of engagement than active forces? And if so, why is that? And I would say really unequivocally, yes. And, you know, we can use Ukraine as an example. So Dave Baldwin has been the adjutant general for just over 10 years. So because he has been there and because in the National Guard, most of our soldiers and airmen stay in the formation or in that state their entire career, the young sergeants that train with Ukrainian sergeants will become command sergeant majors one day or senior enlisted leaders. And the same with our officers, the captains that train together eventually become majors, lieutenant colonels, and then in, in some cases actually chiefs of defense. And so if you look at, you know, Dave Spann, which is, you know, a little bit longer than most, um, but because he has been there for almost 10 years, if you look at had you picked an active duty unit to do that, um, they would have gone through five or six different commanders. And every three years, the entire unit will have changed out. And because our units don't change out like that, you know, it's a friendly face that you see. And the more often you see each other, the more friendly, the more better your relationship is, and the more willingness to, to really sit down and, and have those honest conversations that, that we need to have. Is there anything uh, also in terms of scale? You know, I don't know how many uh, members other, there are of the California National Guard, but I, it's probably a more equivalent kind of organizational size to plug into a country? It, it is, and in many cases, when you look at our partnerships, some of them are smaller countries. And so when we look at a, a country that would like to partner, um, say for instance, this, actually for lunch today, I had lunch with the uh, Minister of Defense from Austria. And they are signing tomorrow in Vermont a state partnership with Vermont. Oh, neat. And so when you look at the size of the military, um, also Vermont, mountainous, sure. like Austria, yeah. um, there are many factors that they put into place. You know, the Von Trapp family was another one. Um, but when they look at that, they try and pair a state that is uh, usually similarly organized, um, in many cases similar equipment as well, so they start to develop that relationship. Now the good thing is, though, is if you're a state partner with any one state, and let's say that 
they want to look at a, a certain type of weapon system, but it's not resident in Vermont, then Vermont will identify that state and they will facilitate that state training with their partner. And so even though it's a one-on-one a -on -one relationship, you really have access to subject matter experts across all 54. And where this is really prevalent, when you look at the only special forces in the Army that are outside the active Army or in the National Guard, we have two special forces groups. And so a lot of countries want to train with their special operators. And so even though our group headquarters are in Utah and Alabama, we have battalions and companies across the country. And so whatever that country would like to train on, we identify the best team for that, and then they'll either train there or, or over here. Uh, I, you know, I think that's a wonderful situation. Let me ask you this. So having been in the Pentagon for more years than I'm willing to admit, uh, my sense is the state partnership program has kind of flown under the radar screen of most uh, senior military officers. And um, it's not a secret. Nobody's, you know, trying to conduct this program in secret or anything Absolutely. like that. But it doesn't, it doesn't get a lot of publicity. And I'll, be, uh, I'll confess, when I was getting ready for this event, I went and tried to find the, the budget item in the, the Pentagon for the state partnership program. And I failed miserably. And I don't think that's because I'm incompetent. I just don't think there is a line that's labeled uh, start state partnership program, and so I'm wondering if you think, uh, given the prominence that the nat you know the previous national defense strategies put a lot of prominence on alliances and partnerships, I think this administration has taken it probably to another level. Do you think that's going to change? Are we going to change the way we handle this, or is it going to kind of be the way it has been? Well, you know, you always want to take advantage of opportunities, right? and when you read the national defense strategy. Um, and the importance that it places even more so on allies and partners. Uh, that's actually one of our top legislative priorities is to ensure that we have consistent, stable funding for this program. So when you look at the fact, you know, we've got 87 partnerships, as you mentioned, with 93 different countries, you know, that's 45% of the countries on earth. And so the long-term value there we see is very significant, but our budget is about 1% of the DOD's budget when it comes to training with allies and partners. We do this all for about, about $40 million. And so we're working with, with Congress right now to ensure the stability of that funding because most countries don't have the same fiscal year as us, whereas it's 30 September and, and 1 October. And so we're trying to look for the opportunities that we can actually execute the full intent across the fiscal years so that we can continue to, to plan long term with each of these, these partners. Um, so I know you work through the geographic combatant commanders, like yes. uh, Indo-Pacific Command and uh, UCOM. What, and I'm sure you pass through there and, they, and you talk. What, what's their view of this program? You know, almost to a person, all the combatant commanders, it's, it's one of the greatest assets that they have. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, right now, UCOM and Indo-PACOM have a lot of priority. In UCOM, we've got 23 partnerships. 12 of those have gone on to become NATO allies. If you look at Indo-PACOM, we've got 13 partnerships, and actually six of those share borders with China. So there's a lot of importance there. But what people often overlook is, is Southcom and Africom. And every day, competition is taking place in both Southcom and in Africom. And with so very few assigned forces, a lot of the greatest you know, resources that they have access to are the National Guard. In fact, uh, last year I went to Morocco for ex Exercise African Lion. And there were many of the African countries were there, but we had almost 600 guardsmen. And Morocco has a state partnership with Utah. And I actually got to go in and see a, an extremely well done live fire exercise. And that's really one of the premier events that um, General Townsend, Steve Townsend, is the AFRICOM commander has, and the majority of U.S. soldiers there were guardsmen. Is, um, do you think it's easier to get access to these countries, you know, through this program than maybe say, you know, let's bring in a brigade of the 82nd Airborne or something like that? You know what? I really think it is. Yeah. Um, and usually when we start a partnership, one of the first things we talk about is humanitarian assistance and disaster relief because many countries realize the importance of taking care of their citizens. And, you know, with hurricanes, wildfires, floods, we've learned a lot here in the United States. 
and frankly, they have learned a lot in their country as well. And so our ability to kind of come in, like you said, under the radar, hey, we're here to help um, and learn from each other. And then we start that conversation, we, we train together, we look for exercises together. And then eventually, once we're, you know, have a good relationship, say, hey, what else do you want to train on? Um, any other areas we can help and vice versa, we may see things that they do and go, gosh, you guys are really good at this. Can you share us um, with us some of your the things that you have learned? And so it, it's a value, not only across the military to military, but in many cases, the state will then have their civilian leadership go to these countries and the governor will visit. They may actually bring industry or things that, um, you know, that they do really well in their state and have those conversations with them as well. And in that case, it's not just a military to military relationship, but it goes to a civilian to civilian relationship as well. Potentially with business development outcomes if possible, I guess. Absolutely. And yeah. if you look at uh, Kosovo and, and Iowa, they actually have exchange programs between their universities um, to allow students to go to both universities. And it's just one of those things. You just never know what one country might really want to take advantage of. But when you have that conversation, you find out what that is. And like I said, both the state and the country at our country at, at large gets great benefit from it. Interesting. So um, I have a question about readiness. And I know you uh, managed Oregon's National Guard. You also were a serving brigade commander. And so you have all of your individual requirements, your unit requirements to be made, to be ready, uh, gunnery or live fire like we talked about, marksmanship, all the other training that the Army and the Air Force expects of us. Um, and then you have state partnership program. Is there, is there any tension between those two and how do you manage that? You know, not necessarily between the state partnership program. Um, we have unlimited volunteers to do these things, okay. uh, to go on those exercises. And in some cases, we'll use our, our annual training, but usually we look to the combatant commander because they see such value that oftentimes they will help fund that. And when you look at, you know, if you add it up, it's about 39 days a year. I have yet to meet the guardsman that's only done 39 days <laughs> uh, in light of all the things we get asked to do. Um, but bang for bang, really, the state partnership program, we see really as a readiness builder um, because they get a chance to go overseas, uh, they get to work with um, allies and partners, and it just makes our soldiers and airmen really at every level better. And so is it safe to assume that um, if you're a part of this program, you may get some additional training days to help uh, execute the program in addition to your 39 minimum? Is that, is that a safe assumption? Absolutely, yeah. and that really goes back to the, uh, the stable, predictable funding. Mm -hmm. um, we really look for what's called operations and maintenance and then and manpower days so that we can fund that specifically. Um, another thing that we use that resourcing is, is we actually have what's called a bilateral affairs officer, which is a National Guardsman from that state that is permanently stationed in the embassy. And so when you look at our partnerships, like in Ukraine, we had two in the U.S. Embassy. Um, they're in Germany now, um, but we'll look for an opportunity for them to go back. And so then we have a day-to-day -day point of contact in that country for their military um, to help facilitate identifying what training is next, and then also there to be there to make sure that everything goes smoothly and you know the uh, the training objectives are met. I had never heard of that bilateral affairs it? officer. Bilateral affairs. That is that is super cool and a complete it, surprise to me. And it's one of the most coveted jobs in the guard. Well, I, it sounds good <laughs> to me too. I like the sound of it. So um, you're we'll probably get. Um, more questions, but uh, you're king for the day, let's say. You're the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the SECDEF simultaneously. What would you uh, change in the state partnership program, if anything? So the one thing I would really focus on is, is uh, ensuring that we resource more exercises. Okay. Uh, when you look at the combatant commands, they run a lot of exercises in countries or in regions where we bring the allies and partners together. And any chance we can to send more guardsmen to participate um, and where we see this is we have rotational forces like uh, Thanksgiving I spent in Poland. Hmm. And I was visiting a striker unit from the Washington National Guard. And I actually timed my trip there to go actually see a wet gap crossing, which you're familiar, but for most folks that aren't, it's basically crossing a river. 
one of the most complex events that you can do. And I was there to watch the, uh, the Polish Army, the British Army, and a, uh, a scout platoon from the Oregon National Guard, a striker unit, um, executed wet gap, wet gap crossing. Now, they were able there to do that because they had been deployed there for a six-month rotation as part of, uh, of uh, Defender 22. And as we look further in the future, any chance we can to send units like platoons, companies, or battalions to train with our allies and partners, it just it helps us become more interoperable. Um, it gives us more opportunity to work together to understand tactically how we would work together. You know, if we ever get into a situation where we're on a battlefield together, and so that would be it. I'd want as much training as I could, training funds, so we could participate in more exercises. So, uh, something I, I'm interested in. I'm, I'm, we've talked about mill to mill training other people, but I'm guessing that there's an objective in here somewhere too that talks about exposing other militaries to the United States military and how proud we are of our principles of civilian control and democracy. And, and is that is that a piece of this too? And do you guys talk about that? It, it is actually. In in many cases, we uh, we send our our JAGs, or our legal officers over there, and they meet with their allies and partners. Um, same with our chaplains. And then also, there's also a lot of requests to send our female officers and soldiers and airmen over there um, to interact with them and show what we have learned, um, things that we're good at, things that we need to improve on and, and learn from them. And so it is really a, a wide net. Yeah. And you know, a lot of people do want to train with the U.S. And then, likewise, we want to train with them as well. Excellent. Yeah. So we're going to shift gears out of the SP, uh, state partnership program for a moment, uh, given there's so many other things going on. And I want to talk about recruiting. Sure. So the Army, uh, in particular, is having a very difficult year in 2022. They're probably going to not make their uh, recruiting objectives for a number of different reasons. Uh, the, uh, the employment market is really competitive right now. Uh, you know, you go to a restaurant and you're going to find a help wanted sign. Uh, in the window, probably. Uh, unemployment's almost pre-pandemic lows. Uh, the other dimension is many companies are now offering attractive benefits, uh, uh, like Amazon is above $15 uh, per hour. They're offering education. They're offering, in short, all the things that the military used to offer to get people to join. And so uh, uh, Army is really under pressure. Uh, we'll see how this year turns out. I, I'm not confident. And it isn't just the Army either, the Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, all really uh, scratching uh, to meet their objectives in 2022. How is how's the National Guard looking? So we're actually in a pretty good spot today. Um, we're at about 99% strength on the Army Guard side and about 97, 98% on the Air Guard side. Uh, but like them, we face many of the same challenges. Uh, you know, folks really looked at educational benefits, and now a lot of companies are offering that. You know, we have enlistment bonuses. A lot of companies are having signing bonuses as well. The difference that we look at is, you know, within the National Guard, that you can have that civilian career and you can also serve your nation. And so for us, it's, it's kind of a unique group that, that we really look out for, those people that, that do want to have that civilian opportunity, but then they also want to serve their country. And in many cases, they want to live where they live today or, or near their family. And so we really focus on that because our recruiting is very localized. Uh, many of the units there have been in that community for years or generations. A lot of times we have family members, multiple family members in the same units. And so they see the value that that provides. But you know, ultimately, as we get towards the end of the year, we'll, we'll kind of see where we're at. Uh, we were very fortunate. You know, surprisingly, during COVID, we weren't know, sure what it was going to turn out like. And we normally meet our recruiting goals the last month of the fiscal year. Uh, but last year, we met it in May, which is unprecedented. And the main reason was so many people that were serving in the Guard um, decided to, to re-enlist. And it was much higher than we had predicted. So that was a, a great benefit to us. But ultimately, as we look across the country, we really have to focus on those non-prior service, the people that are coming in straight off the street. and. You know, we see a lower propensity to serve across our nation. Um, we see a smaller number of folks that are even eligible to join the military due to, uh, to various reasons. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of competition for those folks, um, but we're doing everything we can to, to reach out to them um, because we think uh, we're a great team 
and we'd love to have great teammates. So to kind of sum it up, you can offer a stability that maybe active service can't, uh, you might have friends or something, so you know you're going in with a friend pool already exactly. kind of thing, maybe yeah. family uh, conceivably, and you don't, um, you're not going in with both feet, so you're, you're not committing your entire, you know, 24-7 to it, you're committing right. a something short of that, at least after you get through your initial training. Right. Yeah. And then what we have seen is, um, so like I was in New Orleans last year after one of the hurricanes, and uh, there were some soldiers from the Kansas National Guard there. And I went up to see them, but, and you know, even with a mask on, you could tell they were smiling. And I said, hey, so gosh, tell me what you guys are doing. And they could not wait to tell me. One of the gentlemen, first time he had left Kansas, and he was in New Orleans, and he was delivering food and water to a lot of the folks there. And he said, this is what I dreamed it would be like. And... So we try and reach out to the folks that, that want to do that, that not only want to be part of their community, but they want to serve and they want to make a difference, um, not just overseas, but also here at home. Excellent. You know, and uh, I should mention, this came out in a hearing last week with General McConville and Secretary Warmoth. Uh, you know, you talked about decreasing numbers of Americans are eligible to join the military, and that's a, that's a thing. It used to be 29% for the longest time, and now, General McConville, in open testimony, said it's now 23% of Americans are eligible to join the military without waivers, and so that's a kind of a troubling uh, number. Um, shifting gears again, I, I read in the news that the uh, you know the uh, UN, United States providing a lot of equipment to Ukraine. Among those things, uh, javelins, stingers, the things we talk about a lot, uh, uh, howitzers. M113 armored personnel carriers. And I explained to my audience, hey, there is no big uh, Indiana Jones warehouse where we just go in and find things and then send them places. Every, most of the equipment in the Army, at least, which I'm most familiar with, is in the hands of units or there's a small war reserve. And so I remember reading that the M113 armored personnel carriers were actually coming from the National Guard. Can you, can you talk about that? And I don't know if we tapped into you for the howitzers or not. And, is this having causing any concern between you and your your generals? You know, not at all. Okay. Um, I would tell you, as I mentioned earlier, we've been a state partner with Ukraine for 29 years, and if I could symbolize it in two words, I would say, when I talked to the adjutant general, they they were all in. In fact, we had the conversation: Hey, if we're going to send 113s, somebody's son or daughter is going to be in there, and we're going to send the best stuff we have. And so we made sure we checked everything that the stuff that they're getting is, is some of the best that we have because, you know, they're out there, you know, defending their sovereignty and their, and their country. So we want to put them in our part, the best position we can. And I should make note, most people probably know this, but it's an Army tradition that when you're directed to give equipment to another unit, you go find the worst you have <laughs> and drag it over to the other person's motor pool, right? And so you sound like you've kind of contradicted that idea. Yeah, and we had that conversation because, you know, for each and every one of us, we know how important this is, you know, um, an unprovoked invasion of a country and the folks just trying to do the best they can. I've got more questions, but we've also got audience questions, and I want to honor them and, the, and their attention here. So uh, let's go to uh, some audience questions. This is John Venable. He's a senior research fellow here at Heritage. General, it's a pleasure. Uh, a couple of questions that uh, are very pertinent to this conversation. Uh, can you talk about uh, the National Guard's role in cybersecurity, and do you see SPP expanding in the future and in, in, to incorporate uh, roles like cybersecurity? Well, thank you for that question. And actually, that's one of the most frequently requested things that we're seeing right now. And when you look across the National Guard, we've got about 4,000 cyber professionals. And the beauty when you look at our cyber formations is many of these folks, that's what they do on the civilian side. And they really enjoy doing this um, because it gives them, you know, the ability to take their civilian acquired skills, take them to work and vice versa. Um, they just become better employees because they've got a, a lot of broad experiences. But a lot of our countries that we partner with, they say, hey, can you come help us? And so this goes back to finding the right team. And so we try and I analyze, you know, what exactly do you need help with? And then we identify that specific guard unit that is most beneficial, whether it's from that state or not. And then we coordinate that training and, uh, and really, or subject matter exchange as quickly as we can. Because we see right now the, uh, the importance of 
making sure that your networks are secure is, is really, really important right now. Right, let's pause for a moment and see if there's any questions in our live in-person audience here. If you have one, just raise your hand, we'll get you a microphone. Yes, sir. Sir, I'm Major General Hagen, the Norwegian Defense Attaché to the U.S. Uh, thank you very much for your, your comments. It's very, very inspiring. This is a very, very strong tool. Um, we are, you know, tracking all the developments in the other services. You have Force Design 2030, Project Overmatch, ABMS, JADC2, and, and all those transformative initiatives. I was wondering whether you can elaborate a bit on how this all these initiatives hit the National Guard or and, and how you see the National Guard transform as the challenges get more and more complex. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And for those who may not be aware, so Minnesota and Norway have had a partnership that goes back to 1973 and uh, we uh, do a lot of great work with them. So it's a, a not a state partnership, but an enduring partnership that we have. But it's interesting. So. A lot of the stuff that you brought out talks about modernization, um, how the future battles will be fought, and what type of equipment. One thing that's one of our highest priorities um, when we look within the National Guard, in fact, it's one of my top five priorities, is, is modernization. Now, we know that our nation can't buy all new stuff. I don't know if any nation can or even produce it fast enough. And so we realize that there'll be versions of different type of equipment across the formation so my goal has always been that, number one, it needs to be deployable, whatever equipment we have. It's got to be sustainable. We've got to be able to repair it, have the repair parts. And then it's got to be interoperable on the battlefield. Now, not only interoperable across the joint force, meaning the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, but also with our allies and partners. Now, we've got to be able to leverage that capability by working together on the battlefield. And so we work very closely with the, uh, with the Army and the Air Force, particularly in the National Guard, that as they modernize, we're part of that process. Now, you can't always do it one for one. Um, and so in many cases, it'll be, you'll get three or four active fighter squadrons and then a guard one. And a great example of this is, is the Vermont National Guard has F-35s, and they recently deployed to UCOM uh, within the last uh, two weeks. And so we have that that high level of most modern equipment, and they're integrated out there, so they're training there and then bringing that experience back to the Guard. And we really do that at scale across all new systems within the Army and the Air Force, uh, because what we do is we provide that, that capability and capacity and strategic depth, but part of that strategic depth is having modernized equipment, so hopefully we can deter those that would challenge you know, the global order um, from doing something. And so, to wrap it up, I mean, we're, modernization is very important. Um, we are part of that whenever and wherever we can. And then that also helps us as state partners to then share what we have learned from that with our, with our partners. The, the uh, next question is, is the uh, National Guard exploring ways to integrate the synthetic training environment and other virtual training options uh, in the SPP program? Yes, we are. Um, in fact, if you look at the, uh, the virtual environment, um, due to COVID, a lot of our state partnership engagements for the past two years had to be done virtually. And what we're realizing as well is, depending on the type of systems that we share with our allies and partners, is to look at the ability to share those same synthetic training devices. Because in many ways, it's more cost effective uh, particularly if you've got a smaller nation or even a smaller state where they don't have significant budgets and they need to find that right balance of what you have to do in person and then the same training value that you can gain at lower cost in a synthetic environment. So yes, we work with them and look for any opportunities we can. Talked about the uh, opportunities. What are the challenges associated with that? So the challenges are, number one, making sure that we have the synthetic devices and this goes back to resourcing or foreign military sales, um, that we get those synthetic training devices, you know, where allies and partners have those, and the same within the National Guard. In many cases, we share those, or if we don't have that capability, as I mentioned before, linking that partner nation up with the state that does have that. Uh, but the key there is, is kind of goes back to interoperability, 
the ability for our systems to talk to each other and to work together, not just in a synthetic environment, but actually in person as well, in practical. Great, sir. And uh, one more question. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the collaboration between National Guard units and the SPP program? Obviously, there's great uh, relationships between the states and, and our partners overseas, but is there connective tissue in between the units here in the states, and how well is that working? Yeah, actually, and once again, that, that's really one of the great things about the Guard is we all know each other um, because we're in there for, for quite a bit of time. And so the adjutants general and I, we speak every week um, on a phone call, and then I'll meet regionally with them. And we talk about not only the things that we face here internally to our organization, but also what we're learning from our state partners. And in many cases, if a state partner says, hey, I'd really like to learn about this type of cyber capability, and it's not resident, our adjutants general already know which states to reach out to for that, um, for that capability. And vice versa, they see that um, across the board. And the way we look at it is we all benefit from this. Not only does the state partner benefit, but both National Guards will benefit from as well. And at the end of the day, we're just trying to, to create the best environment we can in our countries, understanding that in many cases they have limited capabilities or limited resources. So anything we can do to help make them better and then also make ourselves better by learning from them. Yes, sir. And uh, um, one last question, and this has to do with ops tempo. Um, there was a time when the Guard was treated as a strategic reserve. It's actually come into the day-to-day -day play of operations overseas. This is one more ball in the air uh, with regard to the jobs that the Guard has. Uh, do you see the uh, ops tempo continuing to expand and, and put burden on folks who have two jobs, or is that going to wane, or is it going to level off? So we, uh, we talk about that juggle, you know, your civilian career, your military career, and your family. You know, there were times in the last two years we were juggling with chainsaws. <laughs> um, but, but what it was is we found, though, you know, over the last 20 years, we really transformed from a strategic reserve to operational. We were there uh, with the same rotations of our active duty counterparts, um, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. But when you look, you jump forward to the last two years when we had COVID, uh, civil disturbance, a lot of hurricanes, and the same requirements overseas. We were very fortunate that we never missed a single mission. We met all of our overseas deployment requirements, and on a daily basis, we've got about 20,000 guardsmen deployed overseas. Um, but we also met every single requirement from our governors. And if you go back to June of 2020, we actually had 120,000 guardsmen mobilized doing civil disturbance, COVID operations, we had a couple of disasters going on then as well. And then we had, at the time, about 23,000 deployed overseas. And we were able to meet all of that. And I know 120,000 is a big number, but when you look at the fact we've got 450,000 in the National Guard, we do have that ability to surge and meet all those requirements. And so, but at the end of the day, it comes down to that individual soldier and airman and their family. And so when we look at doing all that, we really look at our lowest level leaders, really at the platoon and the company or the flight or squadron level, to take a look at their soldiers and airmen and find that balance, knowing that there may be some that, you know, they just had a child or they just got a promotion at work, and finding that balance so that we, we don't break that three-legged stool of civilian career, military career, and family. Because we know, for all of us, we have to lean on certain things more so than others at times in our lives. But we want to find that balance so they don't have to choose and eliminate one or two. Um, you, you hit on something I'm curious about. I know your program depends on, in many cases, employers allowing their employees to go serve their country. How's, how is employer support looking for the National Guard? So, we could not do what we do without the incredible support we have for our employers. And we actually have a program, ESGR, Employer Support of the Garden Reserve. But what we found is nationwide, there's not really any single one employer that, that you know, employs most of the National Guard. And so we look very closely to the adjutants general and frankly, the, the individual unit commanders um, to establish that relationship with their local employers and for us at the national level, the biggest thing we can do is give them predictability. If we can tell them, hey, you're going to deploy once every five years and it's going to be in 2026, then 
it really helps that relationship with the employer because they know well in advance, they can plan for this, and then the soldier can also plan their life around that, knowing, hey, I'm gonna be gone you know, for nine months in 2006, and so everyone's prepared, they go there, and then the way they come back, they hopefully smoothly reintegrate back to their job and their, their family and, and continue to serve. Uh, audience questions, any, any we haven't gotten? Uh, we've got some. Oh. Yes, sir. I also would like to join my Norwegian colleague of th thanking for excellent, excellent cooperation with Pennsylvania National Guard, which is about to count the 30 years you know, next year. Uh, very valuable in uh, our development of our capabilities and readiness, and probably in every line of effort, you would see the footprint uh, larger or smaller of the Pennsylvania National Guard, which is great. Uh, I wonder, since the, the subject of the conference is about the national defense strategy and Russia is being one of the uh, two major threats uh, listed there, as, uh, as you can uh, imagine from this one pager, uh, and also uh, General McConville sort of emphasizing in his white paper on the multi-domain operations on forward uh, combat credible forces being more, for, uh, more forward based, and that's a success of the effective deterrence and defense, according to him. I, 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 you mentioned about uh, more money to readiness and training, which is good, uh, but uh, I wonder if there is any niche of uh, National Guard to play in complementing that McConville's uh, vision of uh, being more forward, more with a larger footprint, not competing with the forces that already forward there, but there, as I understand, more a question uh, of uh, troops availability rather than money. So money should be there somewhere. So I wonder to hear your perspective of whether National Guard can play a, uh, a bigger role in being more forward and more on the, I wouldn't call it per permanent, but persistent basis maybe. Thank you. Great. Thank you, and I'm uh, glad to see it. Pennsylvania National Guard has just an incredible relationship. But when we look at uh, multi-domain operations, that's one thing that we'll integrate the National Guard into. And when you look at the Army National Guard, we're 39% of the Army's operational forces. And on the Air Force, we're actually 30% of the Air Force's operational forces. And so when you look at the, uh, the op tempo on the active component and the op tempo on the National Guard side, um, we truly believe that there's, there's a role for both of us in that. Um, that it's really important to get National Guard units forward so that they get that experience in operating that environment. And so we build those leaders that, that are familiar and have actually been there before. And if you look at uh, like our national training centers, um, as I mentioned earlier, in California and in, uh, in Louisiana, we actually send National Guard brigades through there as well, so they get that same level of training and experience. And so, kind of going back to my, you know, if I was king for a day, I would want more resourcing so that we could put those National Guard companies, squadrons, or battalions and brigades so that they go forward and operate in those environments so that if we ever get called to do that, we've done it before, but we also create a much greater deterrent value for our nation by having just not active component, but the entire reserve component to fill any of those roles and missions. So thank you. We're at the end of our time, General. I want to give you an opportunity to make a case to the parents, the grandparents, uh, maybe 18-year-olds, although they, I doubt they're watching this live here, about you know why, why the National Guard? Why should they uh, join in the National Guard? You know, it, it's one of those great treasures of our nation. And uh, as I mentioned before, the great thing about the National Guard is, is you can serve your nation and your community where you are today. Um, you can also have your civilian career, your military career, and, and your family. And there are many things that, uh, you know, I'm a great example. You know, I grew up in a very small town. Um, I had some time on the active component when I came into the Guard. I leveraged the educational benefits. I found a lot of the things that I learned really helped me in my civilian career. And then as I came throughout the Guard, I just, I worked with some really remarkable people. And all of them just had a great desire to make a difference. And you saw that in responding to their communities. You saw that after 9-11 on how many volunteered to go. We've had over a million deployments um, since 2001. And they've just, kind of shown the nation that 
what an incredible capability and capacity is there. And for young folks, it's, it's, it's training, it's education, it's experience, it's the maturity. And what we find as well from a lot of our employers, what they bring to their employer that they have learned in their service to their nation really benefits them as well. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, uh, General Hokenson. Thank you for our audience here in the, in the building here, and thank you to our online audience for joining us today. Really incredibly important uh, conversation we're having here. We should um, post the video of this uh, discussion in about a day or so, maybe it's a bit earlier. Keep check, uh, checking our website. Have a great rest of your day, and sir, thanks for coming over. Hey, thank you, Tom. Yeah.